I was on the tube the other day and I saw the posters for the book. The only happens with Earth, coming soon. <laughs> it's, it's a terrifying message, even in the advert itself. This is a scary book. Are you trying to scare us? And if so, why? Yeah, that's one of the purposes of the book. But my main impulse is really just to tell the truth. So when I started digging into climate change science two or three years ago, I saw a great gap between the news from the academic research and the way that that story was being told in the media. Things were much scarier when I talked to academics off the record, when I talked to scientists off the record, than they appeared to be reading newspapers and watching television. There were sort of three main divergences. One was about the speed of change. We had been sort of led to believe that climate change was quite slow, that it would only be coming decades down the road, maybe centuries down the road. In fact, more than half of all of the emissions that we've put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 25 years, so we're really doing this damage very much in real time. I, we were also kind of confused about um, the scope of the, of the threat, which is to say we understood sea level rise and um, we're worried about that, but we didn't understand how it would be impacting life far from the coastline in terms of economic growth, in terms of agricultural yield, in terms of wildfires even. A few years ago, we hadn't really thought about these factors. And we also were misguided about the possible severity of the challenge, which is to say most scientists understood two degrees of warming as the threshold of catastrophe. That's what they talked about. And that meant that the public understood two degrees as sort of a ceiling for what was possible with warming. And in fact, functionally, it's about a floor. We're on pace for about four degrees of warming, which would be, by the end of the century, which would be truly, truly catastrophic. And I saw a big gap between what the science said on each of those points and the way that the story was being told to the public. And I wanted to share that information mm -hmm. from the science with them. So that was my first main impulse, was just to tell the story. Um, and my impulse, that's, I'm a journalist, and my main um, imperative is truth-telling. and you know, to share the facts as I understand them. And I do think the book does that. But as I've written it, I've also become, as anybody does when they write about climate, sit with climate, a bit of a kind of quasi-activist, quasi-advocate. It's hard to look at this subject and not feel compelled to action. And so I also began thinking about how I was writing in regard to efficacy and in regard to messaging. And many scientists and their sort of colleagues in the press have often worried about this issue of whether um, writing an alarming, an alarmist version of the facts, write, writing that kind of text, writing that kind of piece, is um, runs the risk of alienating people, pushing people into fatalism, pushing people into despair, when in fact what we need is a much more engaged, active audience. And I think there are some people for whom that is true, who are at risk of falling into fatalism and despair. But when I look around the world, when I look, when I talk to my colleagues, when I talk to my family, when I just walk down the street every day, it seems so transparently the case to me that complacency is a much bigger problem than fatalism. And I know that from my own experience, as someone who was living a complacent life, as a you know relatively well-off cosmopolitan urbanite who didn't think too much about nature and what was happening to it until a few years ago, I was brought out of that complacency by fear. So I know personally that fear and alarmism can be valuable in that way. But I also know looking back on the history, you know, when you think about Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, that was a book that was attacked for being alarmist. In the U.S., it led to the establishment of the EPA, mm -hmm. the elimination of DDT, which is a huge um, step forward for, as an environmental cause. You know, the, the fight against nuclear proliferation, the fight against drunk driving, the fight against, you know, cigarette smoking. All of these things are public campaigns that have made use of fear and alarm to shake people up, to disrupt their daily lives in a way that make them really reconsider what they're doing. And I think that that lesson should be learned by people advocating about climate too. The UN recently came out with this major report in the fall, which I think was a big turning point in the way that scientists um, talked about the issue. It was much more alarmist in its tone than previous mm -hmm. reports from the IPCC. And they said that what we need to do to avert this catastrophic level of warming is a, we need a global mobilization at the scale of World War II. Now, as we know from history, World War II was not fought on the b basis of optimism and hope. It was fought out of fear and alarm and panic. We had obviously some hopeful idea of what winning that war would mean. And it, similarly with climate, I think that um, positive messaging is valuable. Absolutely, it should be part of the toolkit. But for too long, I think we left the, um, the note of alarm out of the song of climate change. Sure. And um, I think that there is real use for it in addition to it being true.
the science is truly alarming, which is why having spent two years in, in the science, I'm so alarmed. Before we get into some of the very big questions you raised there, what is it, on, on your journey as you were learning more, what is it that alarmed you most? What hadn't you appreciated before about the climate change story that really struck home with you? Well, the, the main revelation to me was just how fast it was happening. So, you know, I mentioned more than half of the um, emissions that we've put into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels have come in the last 25 years. That alone is an astonishing fact, but when you consider that means that we've done more damage to the climate in the last 25 years than in all of human history before, even more astonishing. When you realize that that is the same amount of time that that's m since Al Gore published his first book on global warming, it's since the UN established its IPCC, which means that the world knew 25 years ago everything about the damage that we are now doing, and yet we went forward and did that damage anyway, which is horrifying looking back, and it's quite distressing looking forward because it suggests that knowledge is actually not enough to motivate action. That to me was really terrifying. You point out that there's an excellent line in the book, I think that really struck home to me, even though someone's been reporting on this for a long time, the majority of emissions into the atmosphere have all happened since Seinfeld premiered. Yeah. Which is in Seems not that long recent ago. lifetime. Exactly. And I, I think that really struck a, a chord with me. Is there not the danger? This is coming back to this point about alarmism. I looked at me flicking through some of the chapter headings in the in the early part of the book. It's it's like the book of Revelation. These are, you know, it's flooding, it's heat death, it's it's famine that that, that confronts us. We are, as a society, used to people preaching doom, and we've got used to a way of dealing when we put our head down and we shuffle past. And we've got to get on with our lives. We've got kids to feed. We've got food to put on the table. We've got jobs to get to. We've got lives to lead. How do you get over that point? How do you get inside people's heads to convince them this is a terrifying prospect, but there is something we can do about it? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the book of Revelation because I think one of the amazing things about climate change is that it really is a drama unfolding at a theological scale. This is language that we're a little bit uncomfortable using as sort of modern members of the basically atheistic culture that we live in. But we have brought the planet from what was essentially a stable climate to the brink of real crisis in the space of a single generation. And we now have about the length of time of only a single generation to really avert the worst case scenarios. That is a kind of collective power that humans have never wielded before. And I think in a perverse way, the scale of the threat, that is to say, just how horrifying um, all of the possible outcomes for global warming, their, test, they, their testimony to just how much power we have over the environment. So while it is horrifying to contemplate what the world would look like at four degrees, it's also a reminder of just how much we can do collectively to shape the future of the planet. And every decade will determine the next decade's climate. This is not something that is binary. It's not a matter of passing a particular threshold beyond which it's all over and the whole world will burn. At every point, no matter how hot it gets, we will all still collectively have the power to avert future warming, um, avert more suffering, and make the planet a little bit cooler. That'll be true even at four degrees, which is, will be, is already hellish to contemplate. But it, at that point, we'll be, a, we'll be able to avert five degrees and six degrees. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that one of the central messages of climate change is that we own this system. We, we did the damage to it. We can undo the damage to it, theoretically. Um, everything about it, or nearly everything about it, is within our power. So when we look out, on our, uh, out our windows and see on TV all this extreme weather pummeling the planet, this is our doing. It's not something out of our control, even though it seems out of control. We have written this story, and the story as it unfolds over the next decades, we will continue to write. Now, exactly what story we will write is an open question. I think that has a lot more to do with politics, social inertia, our culture, than it does with the science. And on those points, I'm, you know, some, depending on your perspective, I might seem pessimistic or optimistic. I think we will almost certainly not avoid two degrees of warming, but I also think we almost certainly won't get all the way to four degrees of warming. And where we fall in that spectrum is really entirely up to us. And to me, that's an empowering message rather than a distressing or despairing message. Now, you talked about because this interests me a lot as somebody who's been reporting on climate change for 20 years. I am terrified by the prospect, similarly to you, yet I find myself at, at conflict with myself. I still take my family on foreign holidays, on an aircraft. Yeah. I still drive a fossil fuel powered vehicle 
we still consume in a way that I know is unsustainable for the planet. I don't have one child, I have three. Um, how, how do we ensure those societal shifts? How do we get there? We're all in a state of, sometimes I worry, a sort of collective denial of our responsibilities. I think acting as individuals, I know if I stopped flying, it wouldn't make a tiny bit, it would make a minuscule, insignificant amount of difference on a planetary scale. How do we get over that fundamental societal problem? I think the answer is politics. I mean, I think that's what politics is for, is to live up to aspirations collectively that we can't live up to individually. That's why when we talk about taxation, we don't ask people to make donations and you know hand over half their salaries to philanthropy. We collectively say, this is the tax threshold that we want to impose on people because we collectively understand that this money should be redirected towards these goals. I think the same model holds true for climate. It's true that you know we could all lessen our carbon footprint. There's been a lot of talk recently about the impact of diet and travel, as you mentioned. I think people should take those steps if they feel compelled to. But as you say, I'm with you. These impacts at an individual level are trivial. The much more important impact is the impact you can have with your vote in electing people who really prioritize climate change, who are concerned about it as a sort of first order political imperative, not as a fifth or sixth order political imperative, which is the way that most even liberal politicians in the UK and the US have treated it and by mobilizing, organizing, and putting pressure on our existing policymakers to make sure that the environment in which we make those personal decisions about travel and diet and other things, the environment is governed by policy that makes each choice we make environmentally responsible. So that, you know, for instance, there's been a lot of talk about meat eating mm -hmm. and, and the impact on the climate. There are studies they're somewhat small scale. They haven't been um, shown at, at you know, uh, anything like a national level. But if you feed cows seaweed, you can cut their methane emissions by as much as 95 or 